It's 2024, folks, meaning absolutely everything gets an unctuous reboot. Total Recall with celluloid scrot cancer. The new RoboCop was so bad, Sergei Eisenstein rose from the grave for the specific purpose of renouncing the very concept of film. And I'm fairly certain humanity's celebrated fewer Halloweens than they've watched on film at this point. Future generations will mark the passage of time solely through Halloween reboots. And speaking of 2014 fecal blizzards, it appears it's half past time for the god-awful GAMERGATE reboot. <laughs> If you've logged on to YouTube in the past two months and have yet to read the word Sweet Baby Ink in a low-effort clickbait video title, allow me to be the first to say, Hello, Stevie Wonder! Huge fan! To the rest of you, the Cliff Blazinski notes are as follows. After the Gamergate controversy, in which a cabal of cringy commies in the games journalism field effectively colluded to cancel gamers as a going concern and got caught red-handed and red-flagged while doing so, it was clear the video game industry, which had been largely left unmolested by Marxist ideology politicos to that point had become the latest front in the culture war. Now, I have a unique perspective on the original, when in 2014, several years after I first began releasing a video series entitled The Downfall of Gaming Journalism, which cataloged the corruption, graft, and pinko politics of professional games journalists, I suffered a profound Plymouth Rock landed on me moment when Gamergate arose around the self-same concerns. And while low energy black pillars routine the alleged Gamergate was lost. Truth is, as I expressed at the time, it was really more of a push. The result? Overt politicization of the video game industry didn't so much disappear as go undercover. Look, Leninists waited entirely too long to try to infiltrate the gaming industry. They'd long since annexed academia, subjugated the cinema, completely captured the comic industry, but video games, those were kids' toys. How could they conceivably present a cultural threat to the people that program public discourse? And then, gaming quietly overtook Hollywood as the single most profitable entertainment concern in existence, all without a whiff of pinko politics in tow. And suddenly, the gaggle of gray ponytails panicked. Rather than boiling the bullfrog slowly, enacting a ponderous incrementalist strategy to slowly surround and infiltrate an entire industry as they'd done to television and film over the course of decades, they went full Fidel Castro in a shockingly compressed period of time with their fellow travelers in the gaming press bugling the call. But something happened then that Hollywood last witnessed during the House Un-American Activities Committee hearings. The frog flew clean out of the pot and introduced itself as Pepe. And for the man booby boomers just joining us, we call that little episode Gamergate. If you've ever wondered why over the past decade when anyone write a Pol Pot opposes agitprop in entertainment, the countdown is officially on for the first witless utterance of the word Gamergate. Now you know. It's the single most traumatic event in leftist discourse, which is why they've spent 10 uninterrupted years positively seething about it. Look at it from their perspective. For over 70 years, the disciples of Antonio Gramsci had blanketed the earth with an unopposed ideopolitical messaging strategy they had down to such a well-honed, ineffable science that from the moment a cultural issue or aberrant sexual lifestyle was first featured on an episode of Oprah, from gay marriage to trans sexualism, we were all but guaranteed to be ushering it into mainstream acceptance in the next 10 to 15 years. And then Gamergate happened the first time in seven damn decades that when cultural Marxists positioned us near the cliff and told us to jump, we turned and said, Ladies first. Folks, Gamergate was 9-11 for lefties. It is a mortal certainty as an aging Sarkeesian lays on her deathbed surrounded by more cats than an Israeli phone book. She'll be muttering the word Gamergate like Orson Welles with that stupid sled. But online discourse repeats itself more than our president. And so we're celebrating 10 years of boofing the Bolsheviks by giving Gamergate a sequel! In case you missed my Dishonored 2 rant, I pointed out ages ago precisely what the strategy would be. Public discourse has failed you? No problem. Quietly slink away and enact a little private 
policy. While some celebrated Anita Sarkeesian declaring bankruptcy a few months back, I cautioned that in fact, it was only the feminist frequency organization that was going bankrupt, while Sarkeesian herself has been making mondo money doing the same thing as gaming leftists at large, consulting on and actively ruining your favorite franchises. Sarkeesian's own website, in fact, lists her primary occupation as being an industry consultant. Quote, looking to make your video game project more inclusive to a wider audience? You're not alone. Today's audiences crave authentic experiences that better represent a wider range of characters. As the media landscape evolves, inclusive content gains critical acclaim and broader audiences. I can help you. Anita, sweetie, I've seen your waistline. Make that a double wide audience. Unless you think this is a mere Marxist bloviation, understand this. She's already done it, folks. Every Arcane Studios release since Dishonored has admittedly employed Anita's consultation services, and it shows. Harvey Smith credited Anita with Dishonored 2's tacked-on female protagonist. Prey employed gender-neutral language in its advertising and campaign at her behest. And let's not even get started on Spedfall. Why bring this broad up? Because Anita typifies the post-Gamergate social justice strategy. Shut up, retreat from public eye, quietly consult, and commence with cringifying our favorite games. And also Forspoken. And from God of War to The Gashed of Us 2, the effectiveness is undeniable, such that GDC now hosts open presentations stressing the importance of Karl Marx as a literary influence in video game script writing. And if you're impatiently asking why I've only uttered the word Sweet Baby Ink once in this video, understand it's by design because Sweet Baby Ink is just one woke spoke in a wheel big enough for Movie Bob to wear as a belt, a tiny tadpole in a pond the size of the Atlantic. Am I the only person who can see the forest for the rees here? My Fire Emblem rock his rant all the way back in, what, 2016? Pointed out early examples of the inbound vocalization we're all witnessing and bet hard-earned monopoly money that this would likely be the tactic broadly adopted by ideologues of the future. And folks, you need neither a finger flip nor a chair spin to confirm my prediction was resoundingly ratified. The results? An industry that once excoriated anything but development quality and incentivized meritocracy, sporting more diversity higher than the average McDonald's commercial and hiring hacks at a rate to rival Disney Plus. And speaking of hacks... It's an effective way to indoctrinate children precisely because it hasn't received much attention and also because children spend, many of them, hundreds of hours a year, and that might be an undercount, a severe undercount, uh, 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 with this kind of content. So it should get, it our, get a lot of our attention. And now finally, that attention is here. Now, since he made these moronic remarks, people I respect seem to have already forgiven this goof to which I can offer but a single impassioned utterance of the phrase, grow a dick. I mean, YouTube channels 10 times the size of this guy's have been covering this for a white hot minute, not to mention media outlets such as Forbes, 50 times larger than the Daily Wire, but go off, Al Borland. What luck for us that weak chin Walsh could ride to the rescue with his comparatively tiny audience and rap to us all about an industry he insists is something to avoid. No, precious, dressing like a male Starbucks barista is something to avoid. But hey, thanks for inventing the concept of video game criticism all the same. I think tomorrow Tomorrow I'll invent being a bearded boilerplate neocon with a closet full of one size two small flannel shirts and the personality of a mayonnaise sandwich. Think I'd be stepping on anyone's wife's boyfriend's toes there? Folks, be patient with little Matty. If you've ever seen a photo of his face before the beard, you know it's hiding a post-it note from God that reads, I owe you one jawline. Matt Walsh couldn't be overcompensating any harder if his Keith Olbermann hipster glasses had a couple of mud flaps with naked ladies hanging off them. Which is why it should be so alarming that the organization he works and regularly cucks for
4 is among the only outlets on the asterisk right that's producing anything at all as an answer to leftist pop culture, at least on the straight-to-streaming cinema screen. Daily Wire is the Russ Meyer of MAGA movie making. From Terror on the Prairie, a barely awake western seemingly constructed for the singular purpose of wasting Gina Carano, to What is a Woman? Which is essentially Matt Walsh putting a bunch of stolen Stefan Molyneux talking points to music. And who could forget the cutting room comedy Lady Ballers? I don't know about you, but I haven't laughed that hard since my last visit to the child cancer ward at Shriners. If you want a truly gut-busting comedy, try training a camera on Matt Walsh for two uninterrupted hours and ask him to valiantly strain to generate an original thought. I guarantee you will blow out your bowels with laughter. And before you fire off about it, you imbeciles, cuck into a closet neocon is not infighting. Because from endorsing never-Trump military interventionist Evan McMullen in 2016 to endorsing never-Trump darling DeSantis in 2024, every occasion where MAGA has presented its back to Matt Walsh, he's been all too eager to confuse our third and fourth ribs with a switchblade holster. The most dangerous enemy is the one at your back. So don't come crying to me when, for all your concerns, conciliatory efforts, that leopard spots remain unchanged a year from now. But to the surprise of precisely no one, no thanks to the Daily Wire, upon following the trail of devalued Biden bucks, there were fed fingerprints all over this mess, with previously undisclosed collaboration between the FBI, DHS, and social media and game companies such as Reddit and Discord being called upon to monitor, and I quote, extremism. Odd. Color me persnickety, but I'd consider an alphabet agency that regards, oh, roughly half the country as extremists to be somewhat extremist. Then again, the FBI's idea of a flame war is flambéing five-year-olds at Waco. But this is what you get when you air quotes elect the same vice president who held video game censorship panels in the Senate in 2013. Even fortified elections have consequences, kids. But don't get me wrong. While I deplore the transparent clickbait and patently refuse to include the words sweet, baby, or ink in my video title, I nevertheless appreciate the signal boost on this issue. Even if it does come from commentators like Walsh and Asmongold who have the unshakable ethics of a starving crack horse. It's as eye-rolling as it is welcome for one simple reason. Daylight is a disinfectant. Ask Nosferatu if he ain't too tuckered out from delivering the catatonic State of the Union. And for the last time, take it easy with Anita's personal life. She's single by choice. Not her choice, but still, I'm Razor Fist. Godspeed. <laughs> And then we're groping, and um, I come 